This panel, you don't have to live like a refugee. Legal mechanisms and strategies to enhance protection of climate displaced peoples in the Americas. We're going to just begin right now. Um, and I'm happy to introduce our chair, Randall Abate, the Assistant Dean for Environmental Law Studies at George Washington University Law School. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, just wanted to give another thank you to uh, to Dean Michael Sharp, this has been an amazing event. Uh, really excited to be here, really excited to be able to chair this wonderful panel uh, on, a, on a very important topic. And uh, so I, I certainly, uh, uh, as, a, as a note, uh, tipping of the hat to, uh, to Dean Sharp, I, I chose this uh, catchy title for the panel in recognition of his passion and uh, expertise with music. So. Uh, referencing a legendary rock song by a legendary rock band uh, might help on a Friday afternoon. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but the challenge of that reference um, is something I wanted to use as a way to provide some opening remarks. So, so as you know, the, the song references refugee, and we are talking about climate refugees as a problem of global governance that is, uh, is, is quite critical these days. And the first challenge is this notion of the term refugee. So uh, as, as you heard from the Ecoside panel, there's a, a definitional challenge that Ecoside faces. And uh, governing climate refugees faces a similar definitional um, threshold challenge uh, the way Ecoside does. But unlike Ecoside, at least Ecoside has that working working term that it's struggling to define, ecocide. In the, in the climate refugee context, we're, we're at an, a, a more preliminary threshold challenge, which is, is refugee the right term? So, so that's certainly something that uh, this area of, of climate uh, displacement faces. Um, there is still no recognized um, accepted term for this phenomenon of, of climate displacement. Climate refugee is a term that has been and still is used. Uh, there are also references to climate migrants, climate displaced peoples. And so that's, that's an initial uh, challenge. And then the more significant challenge is regardless of which term ultimately is embraced to describe this phenomenon of, of displacement of peoples around the world, um, there, are, there are really three challenges of definition and scope that I wanted to, to begin with to, to set the stage for, for the presentations you'll hear. And, and the first is what, what constitutes uh, climate change displacement um, to trigger protection as a climate refugee. We'll, we'll just use that term as, as the, the reference point. Uh, because we can all acknowledge that there, it, it's very difficult to say climate change alone is the reason for that uh, forced displacement. Uh, there are underlying background factors of cultural and political um, economic stressors that uh, go along with that uh, climate-related factor that may have triggered the displacement. So, so that's an initial uh, definitional challenge. Um, and then second is what I would label who's in charge here. Um, is it international human rights law that's supposed to take up this challenge of, of governing uh, climate displaced peoples, climate refugees, or international environmental law that has been governing, or I should say trying to govern, the problem of global climate change for three decades now, and yet what always concerns me about participating in any uh, level of, of the, the, the COP meetings is where is the discussion of climate refugees when we're talking about everything else about climate change. Uh, it seems like it, it needs to be front and center there at those meetings assembling the world's leaders on matters related to climate change, but it's not. So will it be a mix of those two uh, areas? And uh, those two areas are not known for getting along that well together, but that's starting to change thanks to the work of Professor Knox and others that are unifying the human rights and environmental protection worlds. And so maybe there is a future for shared governance of climate displacement issues. Uh, we're not quite there yet. And then finally, that third definitional challenge and scope issue is once we have a definition of climate refugee as the term or its equivalent, what role can and should existing domestic law um, or new domestic law play? 
in protecting climate refugees who have experienced uh, transboundary displacement and, and how will internal displacement be covered within that, that governance scheme. So you're gonna hear aspects of, of that landscape uh, from each of our four presenters today. And there's two minor scope notes that I would add before I introduce our distinguished panel. And the first is climate displacement is global in scope, affecting the global north and south around the world. Um, we are focusing only on climate displacement in the Americas for this panel. But at least within the Americas, as vast as that geographic range is, uh, we will have um, experiences of global north and global south uh, case studies for you. Um, and then also the, the second question um, related to that is that, um, as I mentioned, it's got transboundary and internal displacement realities going on when we're talking about climate refugee governance, and we're gonna give you a, a taste of both of those. So our first two speakers will be addressing transboundary displacement issues, and, and then our last two speakers will be addressing case studies on internal displacement in Colombia and Canada, respectively. So having said all that, I'd like to briefly introduce all four of our speakers up front so we can move seamlessly from one presentation to the next without me popping up and down like a jack in the box. Uh, so Kate Jastrom is our first speaker and uh, she is the policy director at the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies at the University of California College of Law in San Francisco. She also teaches at the University of California Berkeley School of Law where she is a Christopher Edley Jr. lecturer. She's worked for the UN Refugee Agency and the Department of Homeland Security and was the lead expert on asylum uh, for the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. And our second speaker is Julia Neusner. She's a lawyer, researcher, and educator whose work is focused on climate justice, refugee protection, and human rights. She is a consultant on climate displacement with the International Refugee Assistance Project and the incoming legal director of the Asylum and Immigration Lab at Stanford University. She's admitted to the New York Bar and lives in Oakland, California. Our third speaker is Camila Bustos. Camila is an assistant professor of law at the Elizabeth Hobbs School of Law at Pace University. Her research and scholarship focus on human rights law, international environmental law, and climate change law. And last but not least, we have Genevieve Minville. Genevieve is a PhD student uh, in human geography at York University in Toronto, a social worker and a research specialist for the Center of Expertise on the Well-Being and Physical Health of Refugees and Asylum Seekers in Quebec. She also holds a Master's in International Development and Globalization, and her research focuses on forced migration in the context of disasters and climate and environmental change. And so with that, I will kick things off by turning things over to Kate. <laughs> Okay, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Randy, and thank you to Dean Scharf and the organizers of this symposium. It's been great, and I'm really happy to be here, even on a Friday afternoon. Um, my paper is on climate change and cross-border displacement, what the courts, the administration, and Congress can do to improve options for the United States. So a bit of a roadmap for where I'm headed. Um, first, I'll set the stage and give you my take on terminology. Then I'll explain why I'm focusing on the United States. Then I'll talk about the options that I'd like to present for you to think about, and those will basically be international refugee law and the pros and cons of that as a tool. Then regional refugee law, which in the Americas is the Cartagena Declaration. And then finally, using human rights law as an additional or complementary form of protection. The paper also discusses four policy tools of refugee resettlement, humanitarian parole, um, a new program of safe mobility offices in the region, and then temporary protected status. But I won't talk about them today because um, I won't have time. I should clarify at the outset that these are existing legal categories I'm talking about. So in this paper, I am not arguing for a new international treaty that would be tailored more specifically to climate displacement. Rather, I'm making the case for using existing legal categories to their fullest extent. 
All right, so, you know, Randy introduced this um, sort of terminological challenge we have. So, first of all, I'm looking at, what I'm looking at is entirely cross-border displacement, not internally displaced. And, of course, the concern is with people fleeing from the adverse effects of climate change and disaster. So, as Randy said, there's not yet a legal definition for these people. I personally don't favor the phrase of climate refugee because a refugee is a term in international law which carries with it specific state obligations. Most importantly, the prohibition against returning that person who meets the refugee definition to a country where they'll be harmed. All right, why talk about the United States? So there's at least four reasons that I wanna focus on this country. First of all, the U.S. has traditionally been a leader in refugee protection. We are the largest single donor to the U.N. Refugee Agency and always have been. Until the last presidential administration, the U.S. was the largest single refugee resettlement country in the world. And looking historically, U.S. diplomats helped write the Refugee Convention and Protocol. So what the U.S. does, for better or worse, is important. Second, the U.S. is responsible for the predominant contribution to the climate emergency. Most people fleeing across borders are coming from countries that contributed very little to the current crisis. So there's a moral and ethical dimension in addition to a legal obligation for the U.S. to act. Third, the U.S. is, of course, by any measure, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And finally, the U.S. government itself has acknowledged that it's in our national interest to strengthen protection for people displaced by the impacts of climate change. All right, so let's look at international refugee law. It's the closest body of law that might be relevant because it deals with people outside their country who will be in danger if they are forced to return. So refugee law is codified in a 1951 convention and a 1967 protocol. So just looking at those dates tells you that these treaties were not written with climate displacement in mind. Instead, they define a refugee as a person with a well-founded fear of persecution on account of one of five listed grounds or protected characteristics. And these are things like their race or their religion or their nationality. The US is a state party state party to the refugee protocol, and we have incorporated this definition, the well-founded fear, into U.S. law. So the initial response when people started looking at the problem of climate displacement was that the refugee convention was not going to apply. It was not going to be helpful. It just really, you know, was not fit for purpose. So some of the shortcomings or concerns or problems that people point to with using the Refugee Convention include questions like, is the damage caused by climate change even persecution? As a comparison, and I know a lot of the students are doing asylum law or will be, so this may be familiar to you, but normally persecution is one person physically harming another or threatening to harm another. Second, how do we show the connection between persecution, if climate change is even persecution, and one of the protected grounds, because the harm has to be on account of race, religion, political opinion, etc. And third, and in some ways most um, troubling or problematic, is how do, I, how do we identify the persecutor? Usually, it's the refugee's government persecuting him or her, or sometimes it's non-state actors that the government is unable or unwilling to control. So one twist with climate displacement is that the actual state causing the harm, or most of the harm, may very well be a state in the global north where the person is seeking asylum. So that is not usually the way refugee law works. And then also this entire idea or paradigm that hazards are indiscriminate. You know, the rain falls on everyone, or the rain doesn't fall, or the water rises, but it's kind of happening to everybody. It's just nature. So to some extent, emphasizing all the shortcomings, and there are more, <laughs> to the refugee definition may be useful. 
it can help underscore the urgency of the international community coming up with a better definition, a more comprehensive response, another legal category that would specifically address people in this situation. But that has not happened yet. And as we've heard many times today, treaties take a long time. And in the meantime, we have to use the legal tools that we have. So maybe we do need to look at refugee law. There's an increasing awareness and appreciation that even natural so-called disasters occur in a social and political context. So it's a shift in thinking from like a hazard paradigm, it's just nature happening, to a social paradigm. It's happening in a context. And this creates an opening for us to understand how refugee law will protect some people. And I'll share just a few examples. So we've heard a little bit about climate activists or land defenders. So for example, indigenous people in Honduras who are resisting mining on their ancestral lands. That could be a refugee claim. Or people who may be denied relief after a disaster um, because, again, because of a protected characteristic. So in other words, the government's response after a disaster or in response to a climate change effect is not equal for all parts of society. Some people are left out. They may suffer from hunger or disease or loss of livelihood to such a degree that it rises to the level of persecution. And so if they're left out because they're a marginalized or disfavored group, that's starting to look a lot like a refugee claim. And then finally, states may be unable or unwilling to protect people's human rights because of climate change and disasters. And so a very common example given is Haiti in the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake. So the government basically couldn't function. It certainly could not maintain law and order. And there was a tremendous increase in the amount of sexual and gender-based violence. So there was that connection there. So this, sorry, um, got ahead of myself. But so this is really the work of the moment, is trying to educate attorneys, but also adjudicators and judges to see how climate change does intersect with the refugee definition. And again, we have this law on the books. This is the definition in the United States, so we don't need Congress to act. It's, we have to get out there and do the work to use refugee law to the fullest. Okay, and now, turning to regional refugee law. So just a few words. Um, regional refugee law is much more developed in both Africa and in Europe. In the Americas, we have a non-binding declaration, 1984 Cartagena, which expands the refugee definition to cover other situations, which include massive violation of human rights, and other circumstances which ser seriously disturb the public order. Now, Cartagena is not a treaty. It has been adopted into the domestic legislation of 15 states in the Americas. So for them, it is existing law. Now, there are only, this is an example of where the law needs to green, as Honorary Ambassador Knox would say. So there's only a few examples of even the Cartagena definition being used to encompass climate displaced people, so it's an area that does need development. And to be clear, the US has not adopted the Cartagena definition for us to be able to use this legal category, Congress would have to amend the immigration law. So let's talk about human rights law. Um, refugee lawyers call human rights law complementary protection because to the extent that human rights law can be used to protect, to protect against return, that's additional or complementary to the protection in the Refugee Convention against return. And again, this law already exists. The question is the extent to which it can be used to protect climate displaced people. So one human rights treaty, again, if you've done asylum cases in the US, you know that the US protects against return to torture. So that's an example of complementary protection in the US. The text of the torture treaty prohibits return to torture. Another example is the 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which has been interpreted to prohibit the return of people to a risk to their life or physical integrity. Now, the US does not accept this interpretation of, as a matter of international law, but 
could adopt this view as a matter of policy, and this administration has basically said that we should adopt this interpretation. So for this to become law, again, Congress would have to amend the refugee definition. But similar language was included in the Refugee Protection Act of 2022. You didn't hear about it because it was a marker bill. Um, and climate displacement specific language has been introduced in bills in the last two Congresses. So there is increasing awareness that our domestic law needs to catch up. And I, the reason I mention the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is because the Human Rights Committee um, has decided a case in which it found a person who fears return to a country that's experiencing climate change might have a claim not to be returned due to a risk to their life. And so the case involves, so the case is Tishiota versus New Zealand. So a man from Kiribati sought asylum in New Zealand. He was found not to fit the, the refugee convention definition. And then he said, but what about my right under the civil and political covenant? And the Human Rights Committee found that under his facts, he had not shown that his harm was sufficiently imminent, um, an element widely criticized, I might say, of that decision. But the committee did express the legal principle for the first time that the right to life might be implicated by climate change. So this is an important development in human rights law. And finally, where can you learn more? Um, you can read my article. <laughs> in the forthcoming issue of this wonderful journal. Um, also, my center, Center for Gender and Refugee Studies, has done a practice advisory for attorneys in the US representing clients who have a climate factor in their case. So please reach out to me, and I can get that to you. If you're interested in the policy piece of this, the White House did a report in 2021 on the impact of climate change on migration. So it was significant because it was the first time the US government talked about this, climate change and migration. And then kind of the starting point for many of us was UNHCR, the refugee agency in 2020. Um, published a legal considerations document where they really walk through the different elements of the refugee definition explaining how climate could be a factor. So that is my time and thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I broke it. Now you have to get out of mine. I get into mine. Do <laughs> does, does, can somebody help me uh, with this, please? <laughs> oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my research is about the intersection of climate change, US uh, and US border enforcement. And I just wanna start by giving um, a little bit of background of how I came to be doing this research. Uh, so before I um, started focusing specifically on climate displacement, I um, worked as a research and policy attorney with the nonprofit organization, Human Rights First. Um, I worked there from 2020 to the end of 2022. and. My focus was, uh, was um, research around um, limitations on the right to asylum at the border. So I spent a lot of time um, in Mexico, um, in different border cities, interviewing asylum seekers. Our organization had a team in DC, and uh, we, we were, uh, one of my main projects was documenting kidnappings of people who were impacted by US policies that trapped them um, on the Mexican side of the border, where they were, basically sitting ducks for um, organized criminal groups that control those areas. Um, and we tracked more than 13,000 kidnappings and other violent crimes against people um, in that situation and uh, you know, begged the Biden administration to, to, um, to end these policies and let people, you know, um, let people exercise their legal right to seek asylum at the border. Um, but through th doing that work and hundreds of interviews with folks who, um, who came to the border to seek protection, Almost everybody, uh, when they were telling me about what their journey was like, mentioned some uh, challenge that, you know, in addition to the um, violent crime that, that they experienced um, uh, en route to the border, uh, many, almost all of them, exper uh, described experiencing really challenging environmental conditions. Uh, 
walking through really hot deserts, um, get, uh, having to sleep outside in, in um, really awful conditions and freezing temperatures, uh, crossing rivers and almost drowning. Um, I just, it, and it just became so clear to me that um, we, uh, a lot of what you know, what the, the other speakers are going to talk about is um, the uh, climate change driving people to seek protection in the first place. But climate condition, environmental conditions, and climate-related hazards are a critical part of the migration journey itself. And um, and and uh, as as temperatures rise, um, the deserts are getting hotter. These waterways are getting even more treacherous. And these policies, um, my, my focus is on the US because that's where my research has been. And um, that's where the organization I previously worked at um, focused their advocacy. But as you know, these destination countries are hardening their borders, they are um, they, uh, exacerbating the, the danger that, that folks face related to, um, to climate change. So uh, that's that's what this that's what um, this research is about. Uh, so uh, a little bit about where I'm going. Um, I'll talk a, a bit about the interviews I did and my methodology. Um, the, f the and then the second part is about U.S. policies restrict restricting border and asylum access. Um, and then um, the next uh, the next part and and I'm not I'm not only focusing on U.S. policies on U.S. soil or even at the U.S. Mexico border but also U.S. policies that have been, um, that, that have externalized uh, U.S. immigration enforcement to third countries and specifically to Mexico, although the U.S. spends a lot of um, money and resources all over the Americas trying to prevent people from reaching U.S. soil in the first place. Uh, just to um, limit the scope of, of my paper, I'm focused only on, on Mexico and how um, policies enacted in Mexico at the behest of the U.S. government um, and, and by Mexico that have impacts other, elsewhere in the Mer Americas are subjecting people to, um, to more dangerous conditions, um, uh, ma made even more hazardous by the effects of climate, climate change. Um, and then finally, I don't know if I'll get there, but um, there, this bring these, but, but uh, I will discuss in more detail kind of the, the legal issues that, um, that, that all of this raises. So as I mentioned before, for two and a half years, I was on the ground, um, you know, based in New York, but, but going to the border every, every month or so, um, uh, interviewing refugees. So much of this research uh, draws from, from that experience. You'll hear me say I heard this and that on the, on the border. Uh, but in addition, um, I, I led a project in January 2023 um, where, with a group of law students that was focused on the impact of climate on folks' decisions to leave their homes. We conducted 38 interviews in um, shelters in Tijuana. And, that, and we put out a report um, uh, in March uh, on, um, on our findings about the impact of climate-related disasters on folks' decisions to leave. But the second part of that data collection um, wasn't part of that report. And that was about the uh, people's um, experiences in transit with um, with, with climate-related disasters and, and uh, difficult environmental conditions. And this picture, I, so all the pictures that I'm gonna, have, that, uh, that I have here are pictures that I took. Um, and this picture I took in January um, when we actually witnessed firsthand um, the climate hazards that, that folks uh, face in, in Tijuana as a consequence um, of US policies trapping them there without stable housing. We were on our way to the shelter to interview them. Um, and this was in January 2023, a, um, a, a bomb cyclone um, precipitation event affecting Baja California had in, totally flooded the access road. It flooded the shelter itself, soaked through people's bedding, and, um, and made a lot of those, those people sick. So these were some of the law students that I was working with trying to make their way to the shelter. And then in addition, um, I, I interviewed a number of Venezuelan asylum seekers in New York um, who had passed through the Darien Gap and, and Mexico. Um, and about their experiences, uh, and um, and and it also draws on publicly reported sources as well. So um, policies restricting access to the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, I may also refer to these as pushback policies, uh, which has um, the uh, Felipe Gonzalez Morales, the special rapporteur on the human rights of migrants, um, put out a report a couple years ago on pushbacks and defines pushbacks as. Measures taken by states which result in migrants, including asylum seekers, being summarily forced back to the country where they attempted to cross or have crossed an international border without access to international protection or asylum procedures 
or denied of the individual assessment on their protection needs, which may lead to a violation of the principle of non-refoulement, which um, Kate referenced before, which the um, prohibition under international law of forced return to a place where, where people face danger. Um, and I, I should also mention, just for people who aren't familiar with, um, with asylum, under US and, un, and international law, somebody who fears, um, who fears uh, harm based on protected ground of their home country has the right to seek asylum um, if, uh, in, the, in the United States, including at a port of entry, regardless of their manner of entry. So all of these um, pushback policies, uh, my organization long argued, were violate international and US law because, uh, and, 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 and I won't get into all the various court decisions that have found that, that to be true, that, um, that, if, that these, these people are showing up in US soil asking for protection and being forced, uh, forced back to Mexico or the countries they fled, and that is a very clear violation of, um, of asylum law and refugee protection law. So, um, but all of this, but but all this dates back to way before my work, um, you know, in, in 2020, um, and and even before 1994. But that's where I'm going to start because that's where the when the U.S. government implemented its uh, so-called prevention by deterrence strategy, um, which made uh, unauthorized border crossings more difficult and dangerous um, by increasing enforcement near ports of entry and in urban areas. And I'm just going to read from you what the Border Patrol wrote in its strategic plan outlining this strategy. Um, so they wrote that, border cro that people crossing the border would be, quote, forced over more hostile terrain, less suited for crossing. And the plan also acknowledges that, uh, quote, mountains, deserts, lakes, rivers, and valleys form natural barriers to passage. Temperatures ra ranging from sub-zero along the northern border to the searing heat of the southern border affect Ill illegal entry traffic as well as enforcement efforts. Illegal entrants crossing through remote, uninhabited expanses of land and sea along the border can find themselves in mortal danger. So, um, you know, the idea behind, behind pre prevention by deterrence, as its name suggests, is that by making these crossings so difficult and dangerous and unpleasant, people won't come. Of course, that's not what, that's not what happened, but that hasn't stopped um, the U.S. and other governments from continuing to um, create policy as if uh, this is, is a reality. Um, and since, 19, since um, 1994, these it, the restrictive policies of the border have just gotten much, much worse. Um, the number of uh, border patrol, patrol, the U.S. has surged resources to um, militarizing the border with um, uh, the number of border patrol agents on the ground has swelled from 1,500 in the 1970s to more than 19,000 today. Um, and then fast forward to Trump administration, uh, we're all familiar with the zero tolerance policy, I won't get too much into it, but um, the administration increased criminal prosecutions of non-citizens arriving without authoriza authorization and also directed Department of Homeland Security officials to separate parents from their children. Extremely cruel. Didn't stop people from coming. Um, and then the Remain in Mexico policy, which forced people to go back to Mexico um, pending the, the uh, completion of their adjudication of their asylum claims. And then, um, and then Title 42, that's supposed to be a new bullet point, circumventing legal Pathways final rule or there's a different um, policy. Title 42's pandemic era restrictions on access to asylum at the border, enabling the government to expel um, folks to the countries they fled um, and to Mexico. Oh man, okay. Um, and then um, finally, the circumventing legal pathways rule create uh, replace Title 42, and that's what's trapping people at the border now. That creates additional barriers to um, to uh, to um, access to asylum and um, and makes it very difficult to uh, to be able to enter at a port of entry. So I'm going to breeze through the border exter externalization policies. The, so the U.S. has um, has pressured Mexico to implement a number of policies that have um, increased the danger that folks um, face uh, on on the move. So um, a lot of funding to more security forces, including National Guard for enforcement of Mexico, increased use of detention and deportations, including many reports of illegal detentions um, and, and illegal deportations for people forced back to the border with Guatemala um, without, uh, uh, without any kind of assessment of their asylum claim, um, restricted access to public transportation, and then new visa restrictions for Brazilians, Ecuadorians, and Venezuelans. So the impact of these policies, uh, which is the main <laughs> focus of the paper, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through it quickly. So, um, so policies restricting safe and regular migration access pushed people into more dangerous territory, made more treacherous by the impacts of climate change. 
So um, the number, so, and we can, and the number of these, these policies haven't stopped people from coming. We're seeing record numbers of, pe of uh, people crossing between ports of entry. And warning, warming temperatures are making these, uh, these crossings uh, more deadly than ever. More than 850 people died trying to cross the U.S.-Mexico border um, last year, making fiscal year 2022 the deadliest year on record for migrants at the border. Heat exposure was the most common cause of death, um, followed by drownings. Um, and then uh, my research also, and then, so that's, that's in the US borderlands. Um, through Mexico, all of this restrictions on, people actually aren't access, able to get on buses. They're being pulled off buses by police, not, not allowed to board without legal status. So people are loading onto um, fr this freight train, um, La Bestia, or the Beast, in Mexico, where they're exposed to extreme temperatures, both very hot temperatures, very cold temperatures, um, very, very dangerous. Um, and, uh, and then finally, the Darien Gap, that is this stretch of notoriously dangerous jungle between um, Colombia and Panama. Why do I bring that up when I say I'm only talking about Mexico, externalization of Mexico? Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, under pressure from the United States, the Mexico implemented new visa restrictions for Brazilians, Ecuadorians, and, um, and Venezuelans. Uh, and the vast majority of people who have come through the Darien Gap are Venezuelans. Um, and Venezuelans, you previously were able to get visas and go directly to Mexico um, and skip that really, really awful part of the journey where, um, where uh, for those who aren't familiar, it's been in the news a lot lately, but uh, the Darien Gap uh, is, um, is, is about 60 mile stretch of jungle with no roads. It's uh, people die there quite often. When it rains, it's almost impenetrable. Um, and the stories I heard from that place are absolutely horrific. A lot of people can't even talk about it because they're so traumatized. They say it was absolutely the worst part of the journey. Um, and then in addition to, like, to diverting people into these, uh, into these more dangerous crossings, um, the, uh, the, po the US policies that prevent people from accessing asylum at the border and trap them in Mexico have created just massive bottlenecks at the border. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then Mexican policies uh, implemented at the behest of the United States that, for, that keep people at, um, at the um, southern border with Guatemala have just forced these massive numbers of people to be stuck kind of in limbo. They can't go home, they're seeking um, protection, and they can't move forward. So they are living in very precarious situations. Um, what you see here is the tent encampment at the uh, port of entry in Tijuana, um, where people are unprotected from extreme heat. Um, and extreme cold, it, it, there, it got, uh, there, there were unseasonably freezing temperatures in Tijuana this past winter, um, well, snow in, in, um, in, in Texas last year, and uh, people are facing um, severe illness and, um, and experience a lot of injuries as a result of these, um, of these environmental conditions made worse by, by uh, climate change. And, um, and I, and then, so I guess I'll just um, I'll just I'll just conclude by saying, um, I, well, I have my my paper has tons of specific examples of, of folks I spoke with, um, publicly reported cases of um, of people who uh, who experienced really horrible heat related um, uh, uh, injuries uh, crossing the desert and crossing um, water uh, waterways that are get, becoming even more dangerous because of. Uh, of heavy rainstorms, um, more, uh, more, more disa disasters that are becoming more frequent as temperatures rise. Uh, I don't have time to get into those, so I just want to um, conclude by saying that none of this is that that these these inj these injuries and the this suffering that people are experiencing to um, to seek protection of uh, is is not an unfortunate. Uh, side effect of these policies, it is their intention, as the Border Patrol made very clear in its um, in, in its strategic plan uh, when it, when it implemented prevention by deterrence. We have uh, private security companies marketing their products to the U.S. government by citing the number of, of migrants who are going to be driven by climate change. Um, the uh, we we see time and time again with the public statements made by by U.S. officials um, that. That um, it's it's becoming more difficult and dangerous. Don't come because it's difficult. So so these uh, the the suffering is intentional. Um, we saw uh, uh, Greg Abbott, the governor of, of Texas, put razor wire um, on the buoys um, in the Rio Grande, um, which has already killed people um, in the past few months. Uh, 
And um, and the I mean this, uh, the way to end this is to end pushback policies and create more safe and regular pathways to protection, um, both in the United States and throughout the Americas. Thank you. Thank you for pulling the slides. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Camila. I'll be talking, shifting gears here, I'll be talking about internal displacement as opposed to cross-border displacement. But again, borders are a social construction, so make of that what you will. Um, how does this work? Oh, great. So just a quick roadmap of what I'm trying to cover here today. So first, why should we care about internal displacement? Um, again, it's not a false dichotomy. We should care about cross-border and internal displacement, but why specifically internal? What happened in Gramalote, Colombia? It's a, I'll share with you a case study, a story of what is known as the first town displaced by climate change in Colombia. Um, we'll discuss briefly what domestic and international laws apply, what do they have to say, how are they relevant, and then what's next? What do we do with all of this? Uh, a quick note on methodology. Um, some of this work just draws from my expertise as a consultant on climate displacement issues broadly, um, particularly in the Americas, um, Central America. But as a Colombian citizen myself and as a former researcher at a Colombian NGO, I conducted interviews in 2017 and 2018 as part of a broader project. Um, that project culminated in a book, um, but a lot of my interviews actually didn't make it into the book because they were primarily with um, more of the, like, it was like sort of almost like a administrative ethnography of like disaster policy. And so I draw from some of that work um, in addition to the literature on this paper. So why internal displacement? Um, you know, you can think of the headlines that you see in the New York Times, in the Guardian, um, you know, maybe the Sun, <laughs> maybe other um, publications about the floods of migrants, the floods of people primarily from the global south, you know, black and brown bodies that will cross borders and, you know, invade or now be displaced and, and, and primarily reach global north countries. And there is obviously truth in some of that, although um, just from my voice you can tell I'm quite skeptical of the xenophobic um, way in which a lot of media covers this issue and why I think as practitioners and scholars we have to be quite careful when we talk about the refugee crisis, uh, um, you know, so on and so forth in the context of climate especially. But I talk about internal displacement because it's often less thought about. We like to think that, you know, folks are moving across borders and of course they are, you know, as, as my colleagues have mentioned. And yet, everyone you agree, you ask, agrees that most displacement related to climate change will be internal. It's already happening and will continue to happen, but most people don't have the resources or the ability to actually cross borders, um, right? So a lot of the movement will be internal, um, sometimes rural to urban, sometimes within urban areas, um, and hence why I think it's really important we look at it. So these are just some figures um, from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center which tells us that internal displacement has gotten worse, you know, in the past few decades. Um, and again, I'm talking about climate and natural disasters or environmental disasters broadly. Um, but we know that the numbers are in the millions every single year. So it matters, right? Internal displacement really matters. And so the question that I try to answer in my paper and that as someone who is from the global south but now lives in the global north and deeply cares about climate justice issues, is what are the duties that we owe to climate displaced people? I'm not here telling you, trying to tell you that the global north doesn't owe historical, <laughs> doesn't owe an ecological debt or, or doesn't have a historical responsibility. Normatively, I believe, I believe it does. But I don't think that gets countries like Colombia off the hook, right? I think uh, as much as we need to push for increasing commitments from global north countries, whether that's you know, at the COP, at the UNFCCC, um, or through humanitarian aid, our countries also have a set of human rights obligations that they must abide. And so what happens when countries like Colombia that haven't you know, contributed so much historically to emissions um, and are incredibly vulnerable um, are faced with this sort of tragedies, you know, natural disasters. Um, you know, anthropologists and other social scientists have told us for decades there's no such thing as a natural disaster. It's all built, uh, it's all dependent on the built environment and the social conditions, right? So 
I, and I think my colleagues mentioned how that literature, I think, is informing a lot more disaster work broadly and, and climate change migration. So I hope most of you in the room know where Colombia is located, but if not, this is a map, uh, you know, upper most corner of um, South America. And then the town I'll be talking about is in Santander, the department of Santander, quite close to Venezuela, um, and that is the town of Gramalote. So just a little more context. Uh, according to the UN, Colombia, again, unsurprisingly, because of its geographic position, because a lot of its uh, social inequality and, and among other things, is one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world. Um, and so according to the Mortality Risk Index, um, you know, which looks at what populations are most and least risk from earthquakes, floods, tropical cyclones, so again, not just climate, but environmental disasters broadly, Colombia is usually up there. And if you know anything about Colombia, and maybe you don't, but you watched the movie Encanto, the Disney movie, um, you also know that uh, it's an incredibly complex place um, that has faced an internal conflict for decades. Um, I think it's often referred to as the longest ongoing, well, you can say ongoing or not ongoing, depends who you ask, internal armed conflict in the Western Hemisphere. Right, so over 50 years, my country has faced all sorts of different um, dimensions of the armed conflict. Um, we were following a little bit of this in 2016. There was a peace agreement with the main group at the time, the FARC. Um, there was a referendum. 2016 was a hard year in many ways because of Trump, Brexit, and also the Colombian referendum lost, where actually my majority, 51 or so of the population saying no to peace. Um, it's more complex than that, of course, but that is important context when we're talking about displacement, disaster, climate change, vulnerability in Colombia. And importantly, the victims of internal displacement because of conflict have received protection under, dom under domestic and international law because of, of their identity as, as conflict displaced people, you know, IDPs, internally displaced peoples. And that will become relevant when I talk to you about Gramalote. So Gramalote, um, it's a town like many other towns in Colombia, but it became, again, the icon for climate change um, when La Nina destroyed it, when the massive rain and flooding and landslides that took place in 2012, um, between 20, sorry, 2010 and 2011 destroyed it. So this is what the town looked um, afterwards. And it was not just climate, of course, there was underlying vulnerability, there was some like, uh, you know, geological uh, flaws and um, fault lines, but it was, precisely because of the level of, of rain, and unprecedented rain, that hit the country. So I won't bore you with the details, but unsurprisingly, you know, there was this whole development in national law, national disaster law, to deal with the event. Um, it's funny, you know, a lot of the social scientists in my country have tracked the, the evolution of disaster law, and what happens? There's an earthquake in 1980. There's an agency created. 10 years later, there's a massive landslide. There's another agency created, right? So there's this evolution that is often ad hoc and reactive um, that has evolved and in some ways has gotten better and yet continues to sort of respond after the disaster hits as opposed to really thinking about a management, um, more comprehensive response. So here is something that is quite distinct about Colombia but I think applies to a lot of countries in the global south. We have this term IDPs, right? Desplazados. If you, if you remember Encanto, this is the story of Abuela. You know, well, with Abuelo Pedro, they are essentially displaced from their town because some bad guys, you know, the villains in the Disney movie, presumably right-wing paramilitaries or left-wing guerrillas, who knows, have displaced them from their home. And there's an entire regime, a regime that actually has benefited a lot from international law. We have the internal displaced, internal, um, sorry, the um, the, the internal, I'm blanking on the name, it's on my next slide. Um, the guiding principles on internal displacement, which have actually been integrated into domestic law. So there's, there's a story, there's a hopeful and optimist story about the influence of international law in domestic regimes. And then we have damnificados, which I can't quite translate to English, but it's something like the victims of environmental disasters, right? Those that have been affected by a landslide, an earthquake, et cetera. And they are treated under a completely separate protection regime. And there's reasons for that, and we can get that in Q&A, some, some good, some, some not. But essentially, what we have right now is a framework that 
does not have a human rights centric approach that does not recognize the needs um, of damnificados in the same way. Partly because it's harder, to the persecution point, it's harder to say, well, you know, there was this agent that displaced them from their home when it's an act of God, right? When it's a landslide, it's much harder to trace that accountability. And, and I think that's part of the reason why there's this divergent regime. Um, briefly, of course, the Colombian Constitutional Court has issued several decisions talking that, despite the fact that they don't have the same status as IDPs, there's all sorts of protections that stem from our constitutional framework. You know, Colombian Constitution is much more progressive than um, the U.S. Constitution, like many South, uh, many Southern states, uh, um, and and a lot of the jurisprudence of the court actually builds on the principle of solidarity, which is quite refreshing to to read about, and again applicable in the context of natural disasters. So. Also, there's an inter a whole right regime of international law that could apply or applies in situations of internal displacement, disaster. Um, I'm not going to go through each of these, but you know, freedom of movement, the right to stay. Um, there's always different ways in which we can conceptualize the right of climate displaced people under international law. So that is relevant. Um, you know, we also have the Cartagena Declaration, as, as Kate mentioned. But in terms of internal displacement, we're mostly looking at the guiding principles among other self-law instruments. So, Gramalote, again, first municipality that the World Bank has now recognized as displaced by climate change in Colombia. It becomes the story of you know, a lot of media attention and um, executive action. And so, after, you know, this is 2021, maybe this picture, the town becomes rebuilt. It's rebuilt through a lot of governmental efforts to rebuild the town, rebuild the center park, the plaza, you know, the houses. And so it's seen as a story of success. It's like, oh, wait, we can actually adapt, or some people may not call it adaptation, but there is a process of going back from the disaster, of actually rebuilding and coming together and being happy. Of course, the story is much more nuanced than that. Um, why? Because it took forever for the town to actually be reconstructed. You know, we're talking about this happened in 2010. The reconstruction is not finished. It's almost finished. But, but 10 years had passed by the time the entire town was actually rebuilt, which meant that a lot of people had moved away, you know, to the main cities, had built lives elsewhere. And by the time the government said, okay, come back. Here's a title to your house. People said, why would I go back? I'm not interested. My family's elsewhere. I have a job, right? So it's a very complex social process to try to rebuild a the town. There was negotiation with the church and other key social institutions to make sure there was an incentive. And then people weren't happy, right? They said, well, I lived on this street, and my neighbor was Juan. And now I'm moving back, but my neighbor is not Juan. It's Lorena, and I don't want to live next to Lorena, right? So there's all sorts sort of anecdotal pieces of, of rebuilding a social fabric that are just very hard to actually reproduce. Um, and so these are some of the challenges, um, you know, poor coordination between agencies. This is jointed framework. Um, in the case of some conflict IDPs, you know, the, they face a, like a double marginalization. They're displaced by conflict and they're displaced by, com by climate or environmental events. Um, of course, like any other social, social process, it's riddled with internal tensions. And you know, there's a politicization of the census, of the registry, because by being on the census, you get government benefits. But you know, how did they know that you were a renter or an owner? How did they know that you actually lived in the town? So there's this whole process where they actually had to interview everyone to make sure that, oh, that Felipe says he, he, was, a, he was a resident of Gramalote, is that true? And then they had to like, sort of triangulate information and, and confirm that someone you know, had a title and therefore should be um, should, should have a title in the new town. But as I mentioned, there's no explicit human rights approach or victim-centric approach. Um, it's all through the lens of humanitarian attention, which I think limits sort of the state obligations um, in the context of climate displacement. And there's no protocol. So, you know, the World Bank has some guidelines. You know, they usually will bring McKinsey consultants that will say, oh, these are the guidelines we should be using. And then it just sort of, every process is quite ad hoc, because there's no national policy, which is, very, very challenging. And then, most importantly, I think, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's this very slow process, right? It's extremely slow relocation processes. People make lives elsewhere, and then they, they come back. So 
essentially what I'm arguing in my paper is through the case study of Gramalote is that first we need to recognize climate displacements happening. The Colombian government is not recognizing this at all, right? It has no term for internal displaced people, um, environmental displacement. It's all damnificados, which I argue is problematic. Um, we have to advance protections of these populations, particularly those living in high-risk areas. And there's a lot out there on what best practices are. You know, um, We have a lot to learn from um, displacement because of development projects. There's a really rich literature there. Um, you know, so building on best practices when it, become, when it comes to climate displaced communities. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Oh, great, the slides are there, good. Um, hi, everyone, thank you so much for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Geneviève. As you've heard um, in the introduction earlier, my background is not in law. I come from a very different perspective. However, I'm very confident that this presentation will be helpful um, in to, to spark uh, some reflections and some discussions in terms of what these insights and uh, issues means from a legal perspective. So just a little introduction to my subject today. Um, last summer, actually, in July and June, I saw my home province in Quebec burning in wildfires. Quebec is in Canada, just to be, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, it was quite heartbreaking to see. So you see, the thing is, and it, it, it's been happening in other places in Canada, but it was the first time in Quebec. So it was heartbreaking, really. And people were quite anxious. Um, you know, I've heard people saying things like, this is it, climate change is here, it's happening now. And while I understood people's anxiety, I, I must say that I was also a little shocked to see that, you know, people suddenly felt the urgency to do something, the urge of the situation, only now that it was happening to us, when in fact it has been happening to others for years and decades now, even actually within Canada, as you'll see today. So from this little introduction and the title of my presentation, you get where I'm going with this. Um, I'll be talking about climate displacement within Canada, and obviously here the use of uh, climate refugees is a symbolic um, use of it, of course. So part of this presentation includes um, findings from a literature review that me and Professor Ivan Sue did. Uh, on climate displacement, and really, frankly, there's not much data on, on the subject, unfortunately, um, so, which is, uh, again, because we, we tend to look at it more from a perspective of global south countries. So I'll talk about climate displacement globally very quickly, um, then climate displacement in Canada, and I'll end on some proactive uh, solution. So here are some pictures, sorry, the mic keeps, uh, <laughs> I'm too short, I'm very close to it. So the, um, here are some pictures uh, that you may have seen before. Uh, this one is from Australia. Here we have Greece, California, and the last one is from BC, British Columbia, in Canada. What do they have in common except uh, from being wildfires? They um, are all taken in, you know, so-called global north countries. I also had like a short video, but. I'll skip that. It was just to show you the scope of frequency and intensity of wildfires in only one year. Um, but let's keep that. And so, oh, actually it works. <laughs> I thought it was not going to work. But this presentation is not going to focus anyway on wildfires. But the thing is that it's been a driver uh, of climate displacement in many global north countries. So it's quite hard not to acknowledge it. Um, and yet there's this tendency to think that people will move out from global south countries to global north countries, such as the case of, you know, small islands, like it's a very symbolic uh, image of um, islands disappearing and then people having to move. But the fact is, it's not that simple, right? So many people will prefer finding other adaptation strategies to be able to stay within their countries uh, because of their attachment to their land, for instance. So many will seek other solutions before moving abroad. Maybe also some people won't be able to move because it's, you know, it, it requires quite um, some economic means. But yet we have this impression that everyone will be coming here, um, just like Camilla really um, did an amazing presentation on, because of all of the headlines that we see in the news, right? We, are, we have this sense that, you know, all these people are coming and it's going to be chaotic and et cetera, et cetera. But most of it will actually be internal. 
And um, so again, I, I'm not going to repeat everything Kendall already said, but my point is most of it is going to be internal in Canada and actually the U.S. as well, is no exemption. So, for instance, um, between 2008 and 2022, there were 480,000 internal displacement uh, in Canada that were related to natural hazards. 42% were related to floods and 54 uh, were related to um, wildfires. And this is related to evacuation. It doesn't take into account people who have decided to move, you know, um, f to avoid future risk, for instance. And so now I talked about um, now I talked about evacuation, about displacement, which kind of implies that it's forced. But the choice uh, of, of course, the choice in migration is of a spectrum, right? So it's hard to establish whether it's completely forced or voluntary. Overall, though, the choice of word is important. So my argument here is that we tend to be quick to talk about climate refugees when talking about and when looking at situation in global, north, um, global south countries, sorry. But we tend to use different terminology when it's happening in, um, in a global north country like Canada. So other terminology that do not weigh the same meaning. So for instance, we'll talk about evacuees after a disaster, which kind of implies that it's temporary, that you know the organ organizations like the Red Cross and the governments are taking care of it. But the thing is, sometimes people have been displaced uh, from a disaster for years, even for decades, and they are still labeled as evacuees. So let's see um, some examples of that. So I want to start by yeah, by an example actually that um, affected indigenous communities more specifically because they are disproportionately affected by climate displacement in Canada. Uh, and before doing so, I just want to acknowledge that I'm in, um, not at all an expert on climate change impacts on indigenous communities, but um, but it is a very uh, like it's it's a very important issue. So I, we need to acknowledge that. Uh, because while climate displacement is something new for many people in Canada, it's not something new for many others, including indigenous folks around the country. So I'll talk uh, about the super flood of, we have a little bit of it already, but let's go already to the map. The super flood of 2011 in Manitoba. Anyone familiar with that case, with that what happened in Manitoba? Yes, in 2011. So actually, as you see, the, the, the bottom line is a river that was flooding, and it was going to flood Winnipeg, which is a big city in Manitoba, which is at the star. Um, so the government decided to avoid flooding Winnipeg to divert the water by the canal, that, which is the other line, the other black line going up, and instead flooding Lake Manitoba and flooding uh, Lake St. Martin, which is all up, all the, way, um, up the screen. Um, so this super flood actually led to the evacuation of 18 First Nations and the permanent displacement of Lake St. Martin First Nation community. Because who lives around Lake St. Martin? First, Na uh, First Nation communities in Canada. So in January 2022, they were given a settlement agreement, uh, but it took 11 years for it to happen. And even then, um, we have to keep in mind that they were still called evacuees. You know, sometimes in governmental documents they were referred to as displaced, but even displaced and evacuee do not, is not the same thing. Um, and also a study that was conducted with these, these um, displaced people um, showed that they were actually calling themselves refugees. So it's, it's, it's very, uh, again, it, the terminology here is very important in terms of how it is experienced for the people. And it's not just the only uh, event that affected the area. So in 2014, there was another flood affecting the, um, the same area. Uh, 14 communities, First Nation communities were displaced. Then in May 2022, another flood happened. And so this just shows you know, how there is this recurrency of um, various hazards that are impacting these people, uh, such as recurrent flood, but also recurrent wildfires and even heat waves during the summer. And it also shows the importance of integrating a colonialism uh, dimension when discussing and exploring climate displacement in Canada. And here, I could show you various other examples that exemplify this, maybe perhaps uh, during the questions, but because uh, I think it would be important just to reflect how different people and different groups experience such displacement differently. But what really is important to keep in mind is the need to look how vulnerability results from the structural barriers, like inaction, and also inaction of uh, policymakers and federal and provincial governments and practices that are embedded in colonialism. 
Another example, very quickly, it comes from British Columbia. Um, so it's the city of Lytton, where, again, a lot of also First Nations lived. So it was destroyed in the summer of two, uh, 2021. 90% of it was destroyed in less than 20 minutes. Um, and in November of that same year, so just a couple of months after that, they were affected by a flood. And then a year later, another wildfire. So it just keeps happening. And hundreds of people keep being evacuated. And the recurrence of disasters here makes it very hard for people to foresee a future. In the year and a half since, um, so this is, yeah, there was another one also just a year after. In uh, the year and a half since to the, the 2021 fire, little progress has been made in terms of restoration with only a quarter of properties cleared of ash and debris. Now, why so, right? Why would it be so, um, so hard to restore? One of the, actually one of the answers to that question is because of insurances. So they had some insurance to relocate, but it was temporary. And around 60% of um, residents of Lytton were uninsured or underinsured, leading to delays in debris removal as re residents and insurers grappled with who should pay. Meanwhile, residents are running out of time as the temporary living allowances provided by insurance uh, insurers sorry, are near an end. And adding to challenges, insurers are reluctant to pay for the upgrades to homes that are being written into new building bylaws. So um, the mayor actually of, the, of Lytton wanted to build back better, wanted to build back a climate-proof, resilient town, but the insurances did not want to cover did not cover this idea of building back better because it, it required to pay extra. So the idea of building back better creates delays and people are upset about their situation. Um, and the burned down residents, uh, which many still live in temporary accommodations, want to rebuild homes and get on with their lives, as you can see from some of the testimonies here. So the idea of building back better really leads to some question that you know, one should ask, including whose experience matter, who decides, who pays, for what, etc. And I'll end on this with some uh, proactive solutions to put in, that we could put in place because it's important to be proactive rather than just respond uh, in terms when there is an emergency. So the first one being um, community-based plan relocation. And really, I could have changed it for solution instead of re relocation because um, it's important to, uh, to speak with communities, asking them what they want, what they're comfortable with to be inclusive. And so it depends. Sometimes it's relocation, sometimes it's not something else. So again, here, I could have given you many other examples of displacement in Canada and how the solutions requested by communities themselves really depend from one place to another. Um, different group experience it differently depending on the type of the hazard, the geographical location, their social economic conditions, etc. There's also a need to develop multi-year and multi-hazard prevention plans that move beyond party politics, right? So politicians need to think about what's best for communities, not just for themselves, and their re-election. So this is especially true in the case of slow onset hazards, because the slow violence that is experienced from it takes a longer time to be felt. Um, so for instance, uh, one way that do, to do that would be to, um, to, to define actually climate displacement in Canada uh, and officially de de define it. Um, another, another one is to uh, developing multi-level governance and resources. So we need to avoid bureaucracy that makes it longer, for instance, uh, to build back better, for instance. So it's, it, we need to collaborate among disciplines and among organizations so we cannot respond to the needs of climate displaced people in Canada from only one perspective, from only one lens. So for instance, we cannot only tr treat it as a disaster problem solved by disaster risk reduction plans or humanitarian relief. Because as I stressed before, um, it is also important to address the underlying reasons and structural factors of such displacement. So the how and the why some people suffer for, from it more than others, for instance. And finally, we also need to support and prepare host communities. So going back to the um, example of the, of the Lytton uh, wildfire in British Columbia, where the, st the, the town was destroyed in less than 20 minutes, um, people, you know, they all have to move to another place. They, they move to a city nearby. I forgot the name, but it's really nearby, and they have been moving there 
evacuated there more than one, once for, um, since, ever since then. But the mayor said, you know, they, they were not prepared actually. And even the people were already facing housing challenges. And now that just put another challenge um, to have to, um, to find housing for these evacuees. So again, so it's important to support both the people who are displaced, but also um, host communities. So I'll end here. Um, I hope that I stressed enough, you know, that we need not to fall into the trap of thinking that while now the problem is close to us in terms of space, um, that it's still socially far from us in terms of our personal experiences. Uh, we need a, to be aware of people's different experiences of mobility, but also immobility of the underlying issues and causes. And we must stop closing our eyes on how climate change is already displacing many Canadians every year and most probably also Americans. Um, and yeah, we need to find some comprehensive and collaborative solutions. Thank you so much. Thank you all for those excellent presentations and uh, just wanted to to highlight that it's, it's uh, quite refreshing at an academic symposium to have folks who are not only uh, big thinkers on the issues, but are also very much in the, uh, in the trenches, so to speak, doing this work in the field and, and having their insights informed by, by direct involvement on these, uh, these, these important issues. So it's, I learned quite a bit, and, and I want to be able to kick off the, uh, the Q&A by offering some follow-up to, to our panelists to, to, to get us into the, the group Q&A. Uh, so I'll, I'll pose two questions, the first one to Kate and Julia, and then, and then the second one to Camille and Genevieve. So, so the first one, um, I don't think Kate and Julia got into this as much as perhaps they would like, but uh, the U.S. is potentially well-positioned to respond to this challenge of transboundary migration because we have some existing robust tools that can be repurposed to address those problems instead of having to rely on a dysfunctional Congress to try to create something new to respond to transboundary climate uh, displacement. So, so I'm curious for your responses to um, what existing tools we, we have under, uh, under U.S. law and, and how they can be leveraged to address the problem. And just uh, two examples that come to my mind, uh, temporary protected status, humanitarian visas, and I'm sure there may be others that you two are aware of as, as potential existing tools that can be repurposed to address the transboundary migration issue. Um, from a U.S. perspective. And then for uh, Camille and Genevieve, the, on the internal displacement um, reality, both of you expressed a concern about the, the problem of reacting instead of having a proactive framework, and I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, so in, in the U.S., we, we have this evolving um, response very locally known as managed retreat away from our coastlines as a way of understanding there's a hazard. It's, it's already been a problem. It's only going to get worse. So, so the proactive solution is to help people get out of harm's way before the harm strikes. And so I'm just wondering in Colombia and Canada, what would a proactive solution look like to to minimize the, the, the threat and disaster associated with the, the, the internal displacement scenarios you've described um, and, and trying, what, what sort of hurdles do you envision in terms of this uh, getting past the reacting and rebuilding mindset and, and how are we gonna promote this, this new way of getting ahead of the problem, which ultimately I think will save the country's money as opposed to reacting uh, when, when these problems occur. So we'll start with uh, Kate and Julia's response to the first question. Thanks, Randy. Um, so I'll just mention a couple of policy options that I didn't talk about. Um, so one is temporary protected status, which is unique in American immigration law as the only category that actually um, includes environmental disaster as a reason. Um, Temporary protected status is at the discretion of the executive, so it's flexible in that way. They can designate a country um, when, basically whenever they want to. Um, so some of the advantages are that it is 
a whole country, so it's not like an individual person has to show that they meet a certain legal definition. They just have to be from that country. Uh, so it has like administrative efficiencies for the government. The drawback, there are a couple, but one of the main drawbacks is that people already have to be in the United States. So it doesn't, so if someone is here, there's a, you know, hurricane or some kind of disaster in their country, the most affected people can't use temporary protected status to come to the US because they can't enter on that status. But it does protect people from being sent back to that country. Um, another drawback is in the title. It is temporary. So to the extent that people can go home a year later or something, great. But if they cannot, and the temporary protected status runs out, usually their only option is to apply for asylum, which they may not qualify for in terms of the definition. And our asylum system is severely backlogged. So it just adds to the backlog because it is not like a permanent solution. Okay, but that's temporary protected status, so at least it works in the short term for people here. Another possibility that Randy mentioned is humanitarian visas. So again, the executive has discretion to parole people. So this is not parole in the criminal law sense of the word, it's just permission. Um, basically, it's just, it's just another visa, but it's a humanitarian parole visa, which allows people to come in typically for two years um, and get a work permit and stay. So it's kind of the flip side of temporary protected status. and. Humanitarian parole can be offered individually to people if they can show they have a need, but this administration has used it a little more creatively to um, set up parole, sorry, humanitarian parole visa programs for Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. So the reason they did that was entirely in the US self-interest because these people were coming to the Southwest border oftentimes using the routes that Julie was talking about and could not be returned because we don't have good diplomatic relationships with those countries. And Mexico didn't want them back, so it was kind of to help depressurize our border was the reason these parole programs were set up. Nevertheless, they have allowed many people to come in. So, and that's basically for no reason at all, or very self-interested reason that we don't want them coming to the border. So we could certainly use it in a case of a climate disaster, climate or disaster, to have a parole program for a certain country. And I'll leave it at that and let Julia, Julie talk about it. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, so uh, in addition to those um, programs Kate mentioned, uh, we have a right to asylum at the US border. We have, um, <laughs> we, that, that's, uh, that's, that's been in the US law and, um, and to protect climate displaced people and to um, protect uh, asylum seekers um, who may have been driven from their homes for reasons other than climate, but then who are, uh, as uh, I, I discussed earlier, subjected to the impacts of climate change along the way, the United States needs to um, restore and uphold um, the right to asylum that's already in the law. So that means um, people who uh, people who request protection um, at ports of entry, uh, people who enter um, between ports, uh, which if, if the right was upheld at the ports of entry, there wouldn't be um, as much of a need for people to enter between ports, but either way, um, they have the right to um, a full adjudication of their claim. And, uh, and generally, um, the, the United States needs to approach uh, the arrival of people seeking protection um, in a humanitarian way rather than with, um, with enforcement and militarization. So surging resources instead to, um, rather than to, um, to enforcement, to increasing the number of officers on the ground, to building um, higher walls, uh, we need more, res more resources to, to the immigration courts, uh, to uh, processing at the border um, to resettlement and uh, case management services for for people uh, who who are paroled in. Um, that I think, uh, oh, and and then I should mention that uh, that protect that that upholding the right to asylum will protect climate displaced people because um, the the paper that I I mentioned that that I worked on with International Refugee Assistance Project and some others that we put out in March, 2023. Um, 
discusses how climate change, how, um, how people um, with valid asylum claims often also experience uh, the effects of climate change that ex um, interact with and exacerbate the persecution that they fled. Kate also discussed that at length in, in her presentation. So restore the right to asylum, um, uh, meet people who show up and not just at the US border, but um, at borders throughout the Americas with, um, with resources uh, and, um, and, and support and the, uh, the legal tools that we need to fairly adjudicate their claims um, and, and not with, uh, with, with police and detention and, and taller walls. Randy, that's a really hard question because I think managed retreat is not what maybe I would like to see. Not that I would want to see it dysfunctional retreat either. But I mean, when you're talking about a country that I don't, I don't know exactly what percentage, but it, I will say at least 50% of the country is in some sort of like geological or like geographical high risk area, the scale of the challenge is massive. And so really what you need to do is adaptation, like fund, like climate finance needs to go into adaptation and developed countries need to meet their commitments, you know, under the like green climate fund, et cetera. Like really that's first and foremost, the most important thing. Um, then, you know, once a community is displaced or before it's at risk of displacement, yeah, perhaps a managed retreat approach makes sense. But I mean, if anything, after studying this case um, in Colombia and others, I, I, I think relocation is always the last resort measure. It's such, a, and it's really a cautionary tale. I mean, this, this town got all of the resources you can imagine from the national government, and it still was a hot mess, right? Um, and so I don't even want to imagine a relocation process that gets less media attention and less resources. And part of the reason why it was so messy is because public participation was in part at least the first stages. Um, there was a whole controversy around which site people were going to be relocated to. And so the government actually changed the site a couple times, which then delayed you know, five more years, the whole process. Um, and then there are challenges too with when you have a, a large percent of the population that doesn't have a formal title to the land, and then you're like, oh, here's a new house with a title. That sounds great maybe to a lot of people in this room. To folks who've never held a title, that's A, a weird legal concept or weird concept. And two, it presents all these challenges because now you have, guess what? Higher property taxes and public utilities you have to pay into. And anyways, it's just, I think we're talking about folks who, right, who, who, are, who haven't even heard of insurance, some of them, right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm generalizing, but a lot of the population. So, I just think, if anything, adaptation at a very local level, first and, first and foremost, then maybe manage retreat. Um, yeah, it is really hard, because I don't think there's one size fits all solution. I think plan relocation is definitely an option in some places in Canada, but the thing is that it really has to come from the community and it has to be a bottom-up approach. Um, so, because it really depends, right? Some people have manifested the, like that they wanted that and others have manifested that, no, they don't want that. So it really depends. And I'll give you just two examples to exemplify this. So for instance, there's this community, an indigenous and community in Northern Ontario who um, they have been evacuated by floods every year for the past like 15 or 20 years, something like that. So they have been wanted, they want to be relocated and they've been asking for a relocation. They came to an agreement with the government um, under Paul Martin, um, but as soon as uh, Stephen Harper arrived, um, he just you know, canceled everything. So they had to start again. And now they came to another uh, agreement um, in 2019, but that was just before co COVID hit. So you see, like they have been wanting to relocate in that case, but there are some other issues that makes it very hard. And so it, it also depends pretty much of the political will. And another example, which is completely different, but perhaps some of you are familiar with the, um, what o happened in Oka in 1990. Um, I'm absolutely not an expert in the OCA crisis, so if some people are here, um, please um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a very important issue that happened uh, with a community, an indige indigenous community um, the, of um, Kanesetake, which is in OCA nearby uh, Montreal. So what happened in 1990 is that the people um, were de forcibly displaced, basically, because uh, there were this developer who wanted to develop a golf course. And the thing is, although there is this 
although they live there, although there is an indi indigenous community there, it's not considered um, as a reserve under uh, Canadian law. So because of that, and it's a very complicated historical reason for that, but because of that, they don't have rights and access to their land, so it's very complicated. So anyway, they were displaced because of that for the golf course in 1990. The army came, they pushed them, that, that was very, very messy. Now to go back to 2017, a flood displaced them and evacuated them. Um, 2019, a second flood displaced them and evacuated them. So they were twice displaced, and some of them in 2019 were displaced, uh, were already still displaced basically from the 2017 flood when they were um, displaced again. But this time, obviously, they did not want to help, you know, from the army and from the, the, the governmental aid because, because of what happened in 1990. So in that case, what they wanted was to have the right of their land. So it's a very, very different, um, different um, two different examples, basically, but it's just to show how, you know, there's not one, one size fits all uh, solution to that, and especially in terms of plan relocation, which, which is why it's important to collaborate with uh, communities and ask them what they want. Done now. Thank you all for those help, very helpful responses. We have time for two questions from the audience. Yes. I think you have to for the recording. <laughs> Well, first, I wanted to start with um, thanking all of the panelists for coming and um, sticking out on the Friday afternoon to go through. I think all these topics are really important and brought a lot of issues to our journal, and it's going to give us a lot to discuss throughout the year, so I really appreciate that. That being said, my question focuses a little bit more on Columbia and a case study that I, the parallels that I saw um, in particular with the Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico and uh, rise of the Yo no me quito movement and a lot of this discussion between people who were able to leave the island and the wealth disparity there. And in, in one element, you see this movement empowering people about staying and overcoming, but there also is sort of this face of loyalty to your community and to your culture and to with this relocation there's also like you mentioned kind of those anecdotal issues how can you compare with with your your case study in Colombia that idea of people who relocate and others who are left behind feeling abandoned between that and how when you're spending 10 12 years rebuilding where do you where do you take those steps to to address issues at those levels as well It's really hard. <laughs> I don't have a perfect answer for that. I think uh, we can learn something from transitional justice and historical memory processes in terms of trying to figure out what did they left and what did they lose in having to move and, and or, or in remaining or coming back. Um, an example that you might be interested in is the case of the Raizal people in Colombia as well. They actually brought arguably one of the first climate migration cases um, in, in the entire country. They're, um, they're an ethnic group. Uh, they're actually closer closest to Nicaragua, but Colombia's waters are broad enough that it actually is under the juris Colombian jurisdiction. Um, there was a, I forget the name of the hurricane that uh, massively displaced or, and destroyed like 98% of the island of Providencia. So then, um, you know, with the help of some civil society groups, they brought a case before the, and it's right now pending before the constitutional court, basically arguing under the Colombian constitution, we have a right to place, a right to stay, uh, particularly as ethnic communities were protected under a different constitutional regime, pr protection regime. And so, I mean, absolutely, one of, one of the, there's so many parallels. Uh, and then in the case of Puerto Rico, I mean, I don't have to tell you about colonialism, right? And, and some, some, you know, Professor Pearl was talking earlier today in, in the first panel. So. Yeah, no, no clear answer, just more questions. Time for one more question. Okay, with that, I guess we'll wrap up. Please join me in thanking our excellent panel. <laughs> <laughs>